Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, and this week you are joined by myself, Connor Dunn, if you were wondering. But anyway, this week we are going to be answering all your tech-related questions that you have sent in with the hashtag AskGCNTech. And we'll try and get to the bottom of those queries shortly. So first question by Velo David. This is, I brought out my winter wheels and realized the braking surface, rim brakes are worn out. The hubs and spokes are pretty decent, so could I just replace the rim and keep the old spokes and hubs? Is this economically safe and viable? If I can ask a follow-up to this, could I pimp them up with 30 to 50 mil rim instead, or would that require new spokes, spoke nipples, ETC? Well, David, I say in theory you can, but you do need to be careful that the spokes aren't too worn out. I think if you're going for a full kind of replacement of your wheel and you're really taking it apart, I'd just go the whole hog and buy new spokes. They're relatively cheap, so it shouldn't cost you too much extra to do. So that's my opinion anyway. Next question from Lockie McPherson. And she has asked why you cross over the spokes and does crossing spokes differ with the material of the spokes? And she sent this question in from Australia. So big thank you. Now, spokes are crossed to give lateral strength and that's to hold up to the forces which are induced by pedaling or braking. That's why you rarely see radial spokes on the rear wheel. You always see them on the front wheel. Sometimes you'll see them on the non-drive side of the rear wheel though. I hope that's answered your question. Okay, next question by Philippe Shad. Shad, Shad? I think, I think that's right, sorry if I'm wrong on that one. My hydraulic disc brakes seem to always be rubbing slightly and let out a terrible squeaking sound when braking hard, so frustrating. But even after releasing for a few seconds, I tried replacing the rotors and recentering the calipers with no success. It always returns. What can that be? Well, squeaking or squealing brakes can be because of all sorts of things really. It can be so frustrating when you do hear that squeaky noise all the time when you're braking. But a good place to start is to check that it's not vibrations. So a good way to prevent this is making sure you tighten the rotor bolts and also the caliper bolts so that the disc is properly secured on the wheel. What you can also do is apply some copper slip grease to the reverse of the brake pads and this can help stop vibration too. If you're still getting some squeaking and some rubbing, then a good place to start is probably the alignment of your caliper on the rotor. Sometimes a screwdriver works, or if you have a metal uh, tire lever, that works too. And just get in and make sure you prise the pads apart so that they're not closed too tightly. Now, if it's still rubbing, you want to put the wheel back in, loosen the bolts on the disc brake caliper, and then grab the brake tightly. And that should realign the caliper next to the rotor then tighten the bolts with the brake still hold, held firmly. Now, if it's still rubbing, it might be that the rotor has been bent or gone out of alignment too. So similar to true in a wheel, you kind of need to spin the rotor and see if there's any kind of section which is bent off a little bit. Now, you can get a special tool to realign it. I've often done it with a set of pliers. That works too. So if you want to realign it, give that a go, and I hope that solves your problem. Next question from Joe L, and he is asking, and he's saying, I've just built a superbike with a carbon stem and I first mounted it on an angle with a position which is more comfortable so it's higher for his ride, but he says it doesn't look as cool. So he's turned it down to get that awesome look of a racing bike. But now I have a dilemma of looking good, but it's hard on my back and I'd prefer to have a more comfortable ride. What is your take on that? Second question, how do I send a photo of my bike in for the contest of nice and super nice? Well, first off, if you wanna get involved in the nice or super nice on the tech show, then upload your photo to the GCN app. Now, on the topic of looking cool on a bike, is something I never really managed, but I would go for feeling more comfortable. I think riding a bike is all about being comfortable on the bike, enjoying the ride. I think if you do want to ride it with your stem really slammed down to the, to the head tube, then work on your flexibility. And it's not just about looking cool because you will be a little bit more aerodynamic as well. So work on some stretches. I always found hamstring stretches and opening up my hips, so my hip flexors. Um, you should be able to find some simple videos or some advice on the internet about what to do, but I, I, could, I could try and demonstrate it on this desk, but I, I think I might frighten people. But yeah, hamstrings and opening out your hips, and that should help you get down a little bit lower on the bike. And it will give you a bit of added mobility when you're riding generally as well. Next question by Mr. Clutch, which is an absolutely brilliant name. Do the persons or people driving the cars behind a propeloton, like the Tour de France, 
need to have a certain license or skill level to do so? Interesting question, actually. And, well, they do, actually, in fact. The DSs, as you call them, Director Sportive, they have to hold a license of up to, I think it's five years they have to be working with the UCI Pro Team before they're allowed to get behind the wheel of a car in a race. Or they have to attend the UCI's DS Skills course, which normally runs in August, so you can become a kind of qualified Director Sportive and that gives you the, the ability to drive behind a race. But this is all set out in a 38-page document which the UCI releases, so if you do have time, you can read through that document and see what you kind of need to learn and undergo to be able to drive in the Pro Peloton. And saying that, I have still seen some rather sketchy driving behind the Peloton, I must not lie. I've seen three crashes. I probably shouldn't go into too many details. Oh, I will. Okay, one time I was behind a car and been the convoy, and all the cars in front they slammed the brakes on. The car I was behind did not see the fact that there was a lot of stationary cars in front of them. I saw it because luckily I was taller than the car, so I could look over. I quickly got out of the way, went to the other side of the road, and I heard a massive bang behind me. So yeah, the convoy in a race is a dangerous place, and you do need to be careful when you're riding it and also driving it. So you do need a lot of skill level. Normally, it's ex-riders who kind of know how a race would flow on, on the roads, on closed roads, and, and that would allow them to have experience to kind of get used to it. But you still need to do a few courses and top up your knowledge as well before you get behind that wheel. Okay, next question from Adam. Do you think it is necessary to have protein drinks after training sessions? I'm just coming back into cycling after a seven year break and I'm trying to get back my stamina for an endurance ride. Okay, well, recovery drinks are a, a great way to recover after a session and they're really easy to consume as well. You can mix it with milk or I often actually sometimes mixed it with a bit of natural yogurt to make a little bit of a kind of thick smoothie, which I always really enjoyed. I don't think you need them after every session. It's mainly after a really tough, intense session where your muscles are going to be tired, fatigued, and you want to kind of really recover well for the following day. It will help your muscles repair and rebuild and you'll get stronger as a result. So if you are training hard, they're a brilliant way to stay on top of your recovery and get stronger in the long run. Next question has been sent in by Mark D. Thank you for the question. And Mark has said, what cog ranges do the pros use on their cassettes when they're riding through the mountainous sections of the Tour de France or Giro d'Italia? Okay, so I'll try and answer this as best I can. So, and speaking a little bit from personal experience, generally, I'd say the kind of average gear most pros would use would just be a 53-39 on the front and then an 11-28 on the back. However, this does change quite a lot. So normally what would happen is riders and mechanics would have a WhatsApp group when they're at a race or a kind of generic chat group. And you'd make sure you text in what gears you want for the following day before, you'd have to be polite, so it would normally be a time limit because the mechanics have to have dinner and you don't want to keep them up too late. So it would normally be straight after the race on the bus, you'd let them know what you want. So I'd often kind of stick to a 54 on the front with a 39 because I found Especially in the, on the sprint stages, the pace was so fast, you would need a bigger gear. So 54.11 kind of did it for me. I, th I found a 53.11 was just I was spinning too much. So I did appreciate that extra gear. On the mountainous stages, I always changed that to a 53 and a 36. And then I went 11.32 on the back. But on the really, really mountainous stages, say Mortarolo or Alto de Angleru on the Velta Espana, I'd go for a 53 or a, even sometimes a 52, and then I'd go 34 on the front, and I'd go as just as big a cock as possible on the back. Often, I think I went 11.34 too, so pretty small gear, but I often found that the fact that, I, well, I'd always be in the group better because I was one of the bigger riders, and uh, on those really steep climbs, you just do not want to be grinding the gears when you're absolutely shot at the end of a Grand Tour. So I always wanted to make sure that I could spin my legs and keep a good cadence because I found if I did start grinding the gear, it was just, it made the day so much worse. So yeah, I'd always go as easy a gear as possible, really. And so I hope that's answered your question. Jake Alvarez has sent in the next question and he says, I wear prescription eyeglasses. If I want to wear cycling specific sunglasses, my options were RX inserts and contact lenses. Which do you think is better? And do you have any other suggestions? Okay, so I'm not really speaking from personal experience here. I've actually asked one of, one of the cameramen here on GCN who uh, has, has experience riding with, uh, with the glasses and contact lenses. And they said, if you can find contact lenses that fit and are comfortable, 
this is the best shout. You can get um, sunglasses which have prescription lenses in. A lot of my teammates use, use these as well and they seem to manage pretty well with them. But I think the main point if you're using glasses is if for whatever reason you lose your glasses on a ride or you have a really bad rain shower, something like that, and they fog up, it can be a little bit tricky. I had a few teammates who did lose their prescription glasses in a race and it actually put them out of the race. They had to go back to the team car, try and find new glasses and creates a bit of a kerfuffle. So if you can get used to riding with contact lenses and you find them comfortable, then it sounds like that's your best option. Last question from Naren Hari, and they have asked, what happens to the unused spare parts of the pro rider's bike? The wheels, cassette tires, which are meant to be used when the parts on the bike get damaged or need a replacement. Are these available for sale as well? Okay, so as a general rule, teams are pretty efficient with the equipment they use. Not all teams have a sponsorship deal actually with group sets, so they may have to buy in some components at a reduced price. So they normally are pretty good at budgeting and making sure they have the right parts for the calendar year, so they won't be wasting any money like any business really. But there will be situations when a team changes a sponsor or you know, they have excess stock at the end of the season that they want to get rid of before replenishing it for the following year. And normally what would happen is they would have kind of like a garage sale, actually. Um, I'm not actually sure where they advertise these. It's not kind of official, I don't think, but you do just kind of hear it through the grapevine. Normally it would be a mechanic on the team will kind of send out a message kind of in the local area. A lot of the service courses of pro teams are in Belgium. so kind of in the months of November, October, you do hear these sales going on where you can turn up and it's just everything must go. So I'm sorry I can't tell you where to look for for these sales. They're kind of a bit of a mystical sort of, they just appear and you need to be in the know to know. I've never known one, well, known when to get one, but I've heard you can get some great deals. So maybe do a bit of digging and see if you can find it or if you're in Belgium in November, start knocking on a few doors. But um, yeah, uh, often it will just kind of, the bikes will be advertised uh, online as well, or be sold. Sometimes they'll line up buyers throughout the year. So if you can get in contact, maybe just tweet a team saying you're looking to buy someone's bike and you never know. Hope that helps you anyway. But that is it for this week's Tech Clinic. Thanks for all your questions. And don't forget, if you have a question yourself, write in with the hashtag AskGCNTech. And you may see me back on the show next week. I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully we'll be back. I'm not sure. We'll see. Maybe Ollie's on an emergency flight back from Italy right now. Wonder what he's up to. Anyway. <laughs>